You've heard people say, don't get mad, get even. Although this phrase makes a distinction between the two, it's hard to have the one without the other. In life, when things make us mad, our direct response can be to get even, which was the case for the man in today's episode. But is it possible to quell our anger, our revenge, instead of acting on it? Let's find out. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing you the story of a man who was abandoned and unloved for all of his childhood. Anger was his default, and that anger seemed righteous. So he acted on it by getting even with anyone who did him wrong. So why didn't the anger go away? We'll see just who could turn that anger into forgiveness on today's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you'll want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. It's part one of the classic true story of Stephen Lungu. What do you think's going on in that tent? A circus? That's no circus. Some kind of Christian meeting. Can you read what that sign says? Um, it's some kind of mission from South Africa. South Africa. Nothing good comes from South Africa. It's full of segregation and apartheid. Why should they come to Rhodesia to preach about the white god? Not Rhodesia, Stephen. Zimbabwe. They came to brainwash us. To make us too soft to fight for our freedom. Mm, I know. These Christians need a lesson. They sure do. Tonight, we'll teach them. We'll blow them up. The year was 1962 in a country that was then called Rhodesia in Southern Africa. Young black teenagers, weary of subjugation and poverty, joined the growing revolutionary movement seeking to overthrow the white government. The young man in our story was a leader among them. This is the story of how he came out of the shadows. It's part one of the classic true story of Stephen Lungu, right now on Unshackled. My family lived in a black township on the outskirts of Salisbury, the capital of Rhodesia. I was the oldest son born to Mama when she was only 14. Her arranged marriage to my 50-year-old father left her sneaking beer to ease her misery, which only angered my father. It didn't help I was a sickly child. My hacking cough persisted no matter how hard I tried to squelch it. I often ran fevers. My illness displeased Papa and was a source of conflict. He was often gone for days, and when he was home, my parents fought. <coughs> Stephen's sick again, Chiwa. <coughs> How am I gonna call the doctor with no money? That boy is always ill. He can't help it. He should. We could all die and you wouldn't even notice. You're never here. I know you got another woman and I know- Well, why should I be here raising this boy? He's your son. Oh, yeah? <coughs> Then why doesn't he look like me? How dare you, you wicked man! Uh, Elitina, you've been drinking beer again. I have not. You lie! Stop! I kill myself! I will! I will! I was five, and my brother was three when our sister was born. Papa was gone for longer periods of time, and Mama cried more often. I was nearly seven when he left for good and my aunts gathered, snorting indignation. I blamed myself because he never wanted me. If I wasn't his son, then where did I truly belong? Months later, on a sunny afternoon, Mama took all three of us children to a crowded market in town. Stephen, you stay here, understand? Mama? No, you stay. I must go to the toilet. Here, take your sister. Uh, Mama! Don't drop her and watch your brother. Don't let him run off. Yes, Mama. Stay here. I mean it. I waited and waited, 
shifting from one bare foot to another. As the baby grew heavy in my arms, fear swept over me. Where was Mama? As the sun began setting, all three of us started wailing. People gathered, and a policeman appeared to lead us to the station. I felt utter despair. Mama had abandoned us. How could she do this to me? At that moment, the monster of self-hate and bitterness entered my heart. What are your names? Stephen, John, and Malesi. Where's your mama? She left us. And your father? Gone. Where do you live? We'll look for them. Highfield. It's a big township. Have any relatives? Many aunts. <sighs> you better call the orphanage. The period we spent at the orphanage was very traumatic. I was tied to a pole and beat for the smallest mistakes. I often cried because of the rejection and cruelty I suffered. Finally, the orphanage contacted Mama's sisters and they took us home. But they argued all afternoon. None of them wanted us, but they took turns for a while. We slept on dirt floors, under scraps of blankets. Eventually, we were dumped on Aunt M who beat us in frustration. I started school, but in my misery couldn't study and failed to pass the first year. Everything seemed to be my fault. Then, one day, we went home to a surprise. Hello, boys. Papa! Your father's come back. Now you can't live with him in your old home. Your mama is gone, I see. She always was unreliable. I need to go into Highfield to buy some things. I might as well take the boys along. Instead, Papa took my brother and me by bus and train to Malawi, a small country to the northeast. He had married again for the fourth time, and his new wife didn't want us. So Papa left us with his sister, who treated us cruelly. After a year, and with the help of the village ladies, I made plans to go back home to Rhodesia. I sold my bicycle, and at age 10, set off for the train station where I hid among the baggage on the train. When I reached Salisbury, I took the bus to Highfield, and I finally stood on the path in front of my aunt's house. Aunt M. Oh, oh no, no, not you. No, Stephen. What are you doing here? I don't have enough food for my own children, let alone you. Where's your papa? I didn't like it with papa, so I came home. Home? Ah! How Dare you come back to me after your papa? You are not coming into my house no more. I will not have it. Please, Aunt Em, please. I'm so hungry and... You stay in a chicken coop, you wretched wife. Don't think you have a place in my house. Please, let me out. Please. In return for chores, like fetching water, or cleaning the chicken coop, my aunt sometimes let me sleep in a corner of the house. But I never had enough food. So I spent my days sneaking through the European quarter, scrounging garbage cans for food. The stench and the maggots often made me sick. In time, I made friends with other black teenagers who told me I could earn money collecting tennis balls at the club. I loved the work and finally earned enough to buy a new shirt. Where did you get that shirt? Did you steal it? No, I earned the money picking up tennis balls at the club. You wicked boy, that money belongs to me. No. Yes, I've got to feed you and your sister. It's my money, I need it. I need it too. Give it to me. No. You wicked boy. Steven, hey, what's Steven. going on, man? Yeah. What's the matter with you, Steven? My aunt wants my money. Don't give it to her. No, That's right. Don't, don't give it don't. to her. That's your money. It's not her money. Why go home? I don't. Not always. Where could I go? I sleep under a bridge sometimes. I'm going there tonight. I'll show you. By day's end, my friend forgot his offer, so I tried sleeping in a mango tree. The next night, I found a burlap sack and went under a bridge for cover. To keep the wind from blowing my sack, I dug a shallow grave in the sand, pulled the sack over me, and then swept the sand back over the sack. 
by this point, I rarely cried, but I didn't see how my life could ever get better. The next couple years were a living nightmare of hunger and fear. The rainy season ended work at the tennis courts and ruined food in the garbage bins. Starving, I went to my aunt's house to beg for food, and I found my mama sitting there. I had not seen her in six years. Hatred exploded in my heart, and I threw my knife, just missing her. Then I ran. Depression consumed me. No one cared if I lived or died, so I decided to end my life. My friends had taken me to see Western movies, and I copied what I had seen. Using a rope, I tried to hang myself. Only my inexperience at tying knots saved my life. I was half strangled, kicking frantically and slipping into darkness when a group of women grabbed me and carried me to a road where I was rushed to a hospital. Feeling better, are we? Don't be frightened. I'm just gonna examine you. You speak English? A little. Where am I? In a hospital. You gave us quite a scare, lad. Who did this to you? I did. You? I'm not so good at tying knots. Does your neck hurt when I move your head like this? Yes. You're very lucky. If those women hadn't found you and they did, you'd be dead. Nobody cares. The fact that you're alive means somebody cares. Remember that. I couldn't believe the food, the soft bed, the kindness I received for two weeks. Then they pronounced me well and checked me out. That night, back under the bridge, three of my friends joined me, so I wasn't alone. But I still wanted to die. I decided to murder someone, and then the police would have to kill me. Gradually, we formed a gang, calling ourselves the Black Shadows and the gang became my family. We bought bigger knives, acted tough, and showed no pity. What are we going to do? We got to do Let's something. get organized. We need some kind of initiation, right? Yes. Others want to join. In the movies, they cut their arms and mix their blood together. Let's do that. Good idea. I will do okay. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, but a new member should prove he'll do anything for us. Prove he's not afraid. I'll prove how bold I am. See that old woman? I'll kick away her walking stick. <laughs> That's right. How do you like the floor? That became our initiation night as we became vicious teenagers whose only identity lay with the gang. We mugged and robbed people for their money. My first stabbing gave me a rush of power. But even though I didn't injure the man badly, I still had nightmares. But brutality got much easier each time. I fell ill again and lay with fever, coughing, while my friends became wilder, stealing cars. Then we were drawn into greater darkness and danger. Folks, we'll get back to Stephen's story in just a moment. But first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 73rd year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org. Dot org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, unshackled, we take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, let's get back to Stephen's story. In the late 50s, when I was in my mid-teens, 
the Black Liberation Movement struggle began in Rhodesia, financed by communists outside the country. These outsider Marxists rely on a strategy of dividing people, creating chaos and fomenting violence. Once revolution is achieved and a new system in place, the Marxists seize complete power in the name of fairness and keeping everyone safe. But we didn't know that. And we certainly didn't know Soviet history. We slipped into secret meetings and listened to rhetoric that galvanized our anger. Listen to me. This land belongs to us. It was ours until the white missionaries came. They deceived us with their religion. While our eyes were closed praying to their God, they took our land. Look at how you live. Dirt floors, no shoes. You live in poverty while the whites live in big houses and driving fancy cars. Right. Are you just going to sit there while they take what's yours and no. let you starve? No, I'm not going to. When our day comes and we run the country, yes. you will own everything in yes. common. Yes. You like that car? Get in and drive it. We will take it. You like that house? Then live there. Yes. 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 But you must train hard and fight fearlessly for Zimbabwe. Because I was illiterate, I would never be a top leader, which increased my bitterness. But they used me and many other illiterates to start riots and throw petrol bombs into beer gardens and parks. We also attacked churches, police cars, any big gathering. I was 20 in the summer of 1962, and we were on our way to bomb a bank one night. That was when we discovered a gospel tent meeting. Each of us carried a petrol bomb, so I decided that we would attack the Christians and the people in attendance first. Split up into pairs and surround the tent. At 7 o'clock, I'll whistle, and we throw our stones and bombs into the tent. I want everyone inside to die. We will do it. We will kill them all. Afterward, we meet at the shopping center. Shopping center. All right. Now, let's go inside and see what's going on. Got it, brother. All 12 of us entered the tent and sat on a bench in the back. The singing stopped, and a beautiful girl from Soweto stood and began telling how Jesus changed her life. We were shocked because she was so beautiful, and also because women didn't speak at meetings. Her joy made me feel very dirty and shabby. Then the girl introduced an evangelist from South Africa, which would have been the time for us to leave, but I wanted to hear more about this Jesus. The preacher stood and stared at us, and the crowd grew silent. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Sin is death. The words rang in my ears as he fell silent staring at us. Every evil thing I had done flashed in my mind. The hatred, the violence. Then he began to cry, great heaving sobs. What he said next made us think he knew our plans. I'm crying because many people here tonight may die without Christ. Many of you are in grave danger. These are violent times. You may die soon, and all of you deserve the devil's wages. Death, for all of you have sinned. You have cheated, you have lied, you have hurt others. Do you think God doesn't see your evil lies? Stephen, how dare you tell this man about my sins? I'll kill you. Where? You told him about me? I'll kill you. But Jesus came to save us. He set aside his wealth and became like us, poor and lowly. He had no home, no money, 
and yet he healed the blind, the lame, the deaf. He raised the dead, and he can raise you from the pit of your sin. Jesus said, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Do you think this is true? Shh, I'm trying to hear. Jesus died for you because he loves you, and by his death he made peace with God for us. You can exchange your poverty and sin for the love and riches of Jesus. He said, come, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Tears ran down my cheeks. I longed to be free of the pain and evil that haunted me. So I stumbled through the crowd of people towards the man who offered hope. I didn't know about repentance and forgiveness. I just wanted this Jesus. Still clutching my bag of petrol bombs, I slumped at the preacher's feet and held on to him. His male assistant tried to pull me away, but I held on. My friends must have thought that that was the signal to attack. Dear Lord, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Father, save those who call upon your name. Bring the schemes of the evil one to nothing. Oh, young man, what can I do for you? Can your Jesus save even someone like me? Yes, Jesus died for you. God loves you. Talk about the white man's God and I'll kill you. I want to hear about Jesus. Why don't you tell me about yourself? I told him about my miserable childhood, my father's rejection, the awful day my mama abandoned me, the hunger, the fear, the gang. I was amazed when he began to cry. Then he told me how he had been abandoned at birth and stuffed in a toilet. He never knew his mother and father. He was named Shadrach. Listen to this promise from God and his son, Jesus Christ, to people like us. It's from Psalm 27. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. You see, God and Jesus are the same. Jesus is God's son. He became a man to help us. When you receive him, he will take you up, because he loves you. Oh God, I have nothing. I am nothing. I can't read. I can't write. My parents don't want me. Take me up, God. Take me up. I'm sorry for the bad things I've done. Jesus, forgive me and take me up now. I felt a heavy burden roll off my back, swept away in a rush of peace. Joy flowed through me. Jesus had found the thrown away child of Africa. Looking around, I saw that others needed the evangelist. So I took my bag of petrol bombs and walked into the night. Riots and riot patrols were everywhere. But as I snuggled into the sand under the bridge for the first time, I noticed the stars. I whispered, God, I can't read. I can't even write my name. But I want to spend the rest of my life telling people about you. Are you still there, Lord? Yes. I feel your presence. God, see this tree? See me? If you were here beside me, I would hug you like this. Thank you, God. Thank you. Now I must go and surrender to the police. I climbed aboard the bus into town, crammed with commuters, and I couldn't suppress the joy. I jumped to my feet. Ladies and gentlemen, please, do you know what happened to me last night? 
found Jesus. We don't want to be here now. Hush! What do you think you are doing? We don't preach on Mondays. But I want to tell you. Hush! Get out! Get out! But I. It's Monday. No preaching about the white man's God. With that, he tossed me out the door. I landed on my face in the dust. I was learning that preaching could be hazardous. Nevertheless, as I climbed aboard the next bus, I couldn't resist. I shared my newfound joy with the bus driver, and everyone listened. When we arrived in town, a small group of passengers wanted to know how to be saved. So I led them in a prayer right there in the street. Then I went to the police station, explained my visit, and I was led into the office of a white policeman. Why are you here? The love of Jesus arrested me. What do you mean? Last night, I became a Christian. I realized that what I have been doing is wrong. And what have you been doing? Bad things for the National Party. Where did you become a Christian? At the mission tent meeting last night. Hey, did you throw bombs? No, I was going to throw bombs. But I listened to the preacher, Mr. Shadrach, and received Jesus as my savior instead. I talked to the preacher, and then I poured my petrol into the sun. And now I'm bringing my knife and guns to you. Sergeant, go find the preacher and see if this man's telling the truth. They wanted me to reveal my contacts, but I refused. And when the mission preacher backed my story, they let me go. At the last minute, the commissioner gave me money to buy a Bible. Although I couldn't read, I carried that Bible everywhere. My old gang ridiculed me, but I didn't care. My joy was sharing Jesus on the bus or at the market. One day, weeks later, as I preached in the market, giving my testimony, I saw a white man listening. When the crowd dispersed, I recognized him from Mr. Shadrach's mission team. Do you remember me? Yes, you're Stephen Longu. My name is Johannes, and I'm with the mission here. Shadrach asked me to look out for you. You were preaching just now. Yes. You're still strong in your faith then. Who's helping you? No one. I would love to know more about Jesus. Stephen, I'm starting a Bible school here. How would you like to be my very first student? Oh, yes, yes. Blacks could not stay in white homes, so he set me up in his three-sided garage. Then he took me shopping and bought me new clothes and shoes, as well as a bed and bedding. He had no idea what he was getting into with his first student. Raised on my own, I knew nothing about hygiene or manners, so he had to start from scratch. As he taught me to read, he also taught me to trust God in meeting my needs. By 1965, we were holding evangelistic meetings, but the political tension in Rhodesia was worse. And one evening, our outreach landed us in extreme danger. You won't want to miss the dramatic conclusion of Stephen's testimony next week. But friend, don't wait until then to meet the one who died and rose again to give you eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Give him your life now and learn the joy of salvation. If you need help making this life-changing decision, we encourage you to call 1-888-NEED-HIM. Or you can get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so Send us your questions, and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast, and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform. 
unshackled daily devotionals, and unshackled in person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the new prize for this sweepstakes contest is yet another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. The verse on this one is 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. This plaque is gorgeous. It's contrasting chestnut brown outer ring and the light brown inner ring of the bark truly shows the diversity of God's creation. If you'd like a peek at this scripture plaque, you're welcome to visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page for a picture. The deadline to enter is September 2nd. And next time... Oh God, I'm sorry for the bad things I've done. Jesus, forgive me and take me now. The man in our story led a group of rebels into a religious tent meeting, intending to bomb it. But he walked out a transformed man. You know what I realize? My life is truly in God's hands. Thus began an extraordinary transformation from rage to joy. But the young man in our story had a long way to go. God created you and died for you. You're as good as anyone. No, it's not how it is. You've had less chances, that's all. Are you going to blow this one because you're fearful? And buried deep in his heart was unresolved anger toward his parents. My dear, you're ill. What is it? My mother. I found her. Oh, Stephen! Rachel, I still hate her. Part of me wants to forgive her, but I can't. Don't miss Stephen Lungu's exciting true story coming soon on Unshackled. Heard in part one of the classic true story of Stephen Lungu were Ryan Priester, Michael Martin, Chaz Campbell, Lawrence Halliburton, and Demetrius Troy. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Sound assistant, Holly Krajewski. Recording and audio engineer, David Pierczynski. Script, Kenitha Gabler and Kylie Hammond. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, as our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. <laughs>